So let me uh, start off with a quick story. So when, uh, when I was in college, I had a good friend who uh, said, uh, never throw a brick and hide your hand. And uh, I really think that's true. It, uh, you know, in some cases, we are afraid to uh, you know, uh, say something to somebody's face or be able to tell the truth about things. And there's a quote from uh, Mark Twain. He says, how truth is the most of cowardly lies. And so for really all of us, we should never throw a brick in either hand, and we should never provide half-truths. And so what I want to do today is uh, spend a whole time talking to you about uh, uh, things that I, I think as leaders, uh, whether you're on, you know, on the officer side, or particularly in this case as a senior enlisted uh, leader, um, kind of expectations, uh, uh, working with senior officers, working with our young airmen, and then uh, just ensure that there's no half-truths um, that, uh, that we share as we go forward. And so, first of all, thanks for the opportunity to be with you today. I, I really wish I'd been there in person. I actually had great plans uh, to, to be there, uh, but unfortunately, uh, you know, current events kind of kept me here in, uh, in Washington, D.C., and uh, I look forward to crossing paths with you uh, in, in the future. Uh, thanks to General Hecker for the, uh, the introduction, but most importantly, congratulations to all of you. Uh, it, this is a pretty uh, huge milestone in each one of your Air Force uh, career. Um, not just for you, uh, but for the airmen, you've had an opportunity to uh, to lead the airmen that actually spent time entering, but uh, most importantly, you know, also your, your family and friends who will also celebrate in this particular uh, milestone with you. And so I think that's a, that's a, it's a huge accomplishment. Yeah, realizing, as I, I've been told, you know, um, you're, you're the 1% of our enlisted corps, and uh, having worked with a number of chiefs, I also know you're, you're not afraid of... Uh, of of, uh, of you know telling the truth, um, uh, you, you got you're not shy, and so well, welcome to the club of not being shy, and uh, we're, we're really excited to, to have you uh, be be where you are today, and hopefully uh, over the course of the, the, these several days are together. Uh, I think the one thing that I find when you have courses like this is the aspect that when you when you do courses like you know you'll take a lot of notes this week, and then you'll go out and do what you do, and you probably won't go back and refer to your notes. The beauty of what's, what happens in a, in a week like this is the aspect that you actually have some time to just really think and, and soak it all in and really look at your, your leadership as, as you move forward. And so what I want to do that, first of all, is, is to share with you some of my expectations. So if you go to the next slide, please. And so it's been uh, about 18 months now that I've been the chief. And I will tell you that, you know, every day counts, but every day, um, you know, behind you is, uh, you know, runway that you can't use. And uh, it's one of those areas that uh, I, I've realized that when you get in these positions of leadership, that how quickly time flies, partly because you're having fun, but also for the aspect of there's just so much going on that you just kind of lose track of time. And so what I've done uh, throughout my career, I, I have a set of, uh, you know, my, my leadership tenants that I use, which I use to help set expectations for those that, uh, that work with me. And I, I can really trace these back to uh, when, I was, when I was a senior in high school during a radio interview I did. That uh, eventually, when I became a uh, you know particularly more a squadron commander, actually crystallized and have been able to use uh, time and time again. And so it's execute a high standard, be disciplined in execution, pay attention to detail, and have fun. Executing a high standard, personally and professionally, I do not play for second place. If I'm in, I'm in the win. I'm always put my best foot forward, and I expect that from myself, but I also expect that from everybody who works with me to be doing the same thing. Wow. I also understand that I'm not uh, God's gift to everything I do. There's going to be some things that aren't going to work out. There's going to have to be some off such moments, uh, but it's not due to lack of trying. Because when, I, when I'm uh, in things, it's, it is my credibility that's at stake. Whether it's C.Q. Brown, the Office of the Chief of Staff, the United States Air Force, or in, this, in some cases, the United States of America. And I take that very seriously. Be disciplined in execution. Um, I'm a, uh, I'm very process oriented. I'm one of these, uh, you know, my degrees in engineering. Uh, I'm also an AFI abiding airman, where I try to follow the rules. I try to set, you know, the standard for how we how we execute. I want to make sure that uh, well, we have a process that we execute, so that uh, you spend less time understanding the process and more time to really think about the substance of how we execute. The other part about being disciplined is I do not like wasting uh, people's time, my time or your time. And so um, I'm willing to challenge. If there's something that's not quite right, I'm willing to challenge the status quo and change the process. 
And I've, actually, I've told you, as a chief, I've had, you know, different execs come through here. Hey, have you ever thought about doing it this way? You know, I hadn't thought about it. That's a good idea. We'll, we'll adopt it. And so I'm willing to make changes to make it easier for us to get our, uh, get our jobs done. The attention to details. Um, I ask a lot of questions, and I do that uh, for a couple reasons. One, uh, I want to be, when I go home at night, I want to be smarter than when I walked in in the morning. Uh, you know, as a leader, you always want to continue to learn. The other reason why I asked uh, is partly because uh, uh, I've been burned. You know, it's not that I don't trust people, but sometimes I don't trust people. And, uh, you know, it's very easy when uh, folks come to you now and they'll go, hey, sir, don't worry about it, it's all taken care of. Chief, don't worry about it, it's all taken care of. That's when you should worry. If they can't come back and go, it's all taken care of and I've done X, Y, and Z, just give you a, just a couple of nuggets of details, then uh, it makes you wonder. Usually that's, that's, what, that's a sign for when they say it's all taken care of. Now they're going to go out and step out and now go take care of it to do a little bit of CYA. Okay, and so really you ask those questions to ensure the things that you, uh, people are meeting your intent. And then the last reason I, I really do that is uh, if I'm going to challenge the status quo on something, I, I can't go in and start challenging the status quo just based on emotion. I got to have some facts, some details to go with it. Um, you know, I will tell you the facts may make me emotional, just as emotional as the person that wants me to go do something. But I just, I'm just not going to jump on somebody's desk just because someone is jumping on my desk. I got to understand why uh, to be able to do it. And the last one is to have fun. Uh, I, yeah, I enjoy what I do. I enjoy coming to work every day. Uh, I like to say every day is a good day. Just some days are better than others. Um, and it's the ability to actually do what we do. And if you, if you don't, if you don't, you're not having fun doing this, you probably need to be doing something else or questioning why you're still here. And I think all of us are still here partly for a couple of reasons. One, because we enjoy what we do. We enjoy serving. Uh, but we also, as I like to say, you know, my wife, each, uh, my wife, Shereen, each morning pins my permission slip to my backpack, just like, you know, our parents did when we were in uh, grade school and allows me to come to the Pentagon every day. Because at some point she could say, I've seen enough of this um, and just say, hey, we're going to move on. And so she's got to be having a little bit of fun, too, with, with some of this, or at least some toleration to allow me to do what I do. And I think that's a key aspect. And the last thing I'd say is part of this having fun is to take care of yourself. You know, we're not getting any younger, none of us. And the key part of this, of, of, you know, having fun is, you know, enjoy life because, uh, you know, uh, you, you got to have a life outside of work. And, and so I'd encourage you to do some things to try to really take care of yourself. The last thing I think you can expect uh, for me in, in, uh, is the aspect of, uh, as, as your chief, is I try to be very open, very transparent. I try to collaborate. I like uh, bringing folks into into the discussion, um, but I will make a decision. I'm not afraid to make a decision, um, even if it's going to upset some people. As a matter of fact, if I make a decision and one side's really happy and the other side's really upset, then I probably didn't get the right decision in some cases. There's got to be some give and take there as, as we move forward and look at what's good for the, not just for different parts of the Air Force, but what's good for the entire, entire Air Force. And so with that, that's why I wrote the Accelerate Change or Lose. You go to the next slide, please. Um, Accelerate Change or Lose is really, um, you know, I had two options when I came in this position. And when I was being mentored by uh, those that, that, that sat in this chair before and those others that had been service chiefs. You can do one or two things. You can spend about a year studying what it is you're going to do and then lay out your strategic approach. Or you can bring your strategic approach out very early into your uh, tenure and then adjust as you go. And so I chose the, uh, the latter because, um, you know, as a, as a senior officer and I think as a senior NCO, there's things about how you lead and how you want to operate. And I'm a, I, I like action. I do not like studying problems. Um, I like solving problems. And so part of this was knowing that um, there was so many things going on as I was coming into this position that were going to drive change anyway. Stand up for the Space Force, COVID, from the time I, I interviewed with the president to the time I got confirmed and into the chair, we were into COVID and we're still here. Um, aspects of racial disparity, um, the aspects of the, really the geostrategic environment and today's current events will tell you that's exactly where we are here as well. So there's a lot of things that are driving change. And so I really believe, let's just ride the wave of change. But at the same time though, because of the position I was in as a pac gap commander, I also knew that hey, if we didn't change, we are at risk. We're at risk of, of losing uh, aspects of our national security Losing in a high-end fight, losing quality airmen or families because we're not, you know, doing the things to be able to support them. And so, it, to me, you got to change, and change is hard. And I understand that. But um, again, if you go back to executing a high standard, I don't, I don't, you know, I'm in the win when I play. Okay, 
Uh, and so I'm, I'm not afraid to, to take a risk to, to drive that change. And so that's what Accelerate Change or, or Lose is all about. It's interesting that, you know, I can say it, I hear airmen talk about it when I go out and travel, but when I hear people outside the Air Force, whether it be in think tanks or when I testified recently here to be uh, 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 on the 12th of January with the House uh, Appropriations Committee, and I have a couple of members of Congress talking about Accelerate Change or Lose, then it's starting to sink in. Will it take some time to get there? Yeah, it will. Some things will be able to change faster than others, but we, we can't wait and continue to study. we got to actually act. And then the action orders. The action orders are the areas we're focused on. Uh, Emirates pretty straightforward, you know, and we think we're making pretty good progress there. Uh, bureaucracy, I'll just tell you, bureaucracy's met bureaucracy. It, it is hard to make drive change here, and particularly here in the Pentagon. People are setting their ways. Uh, but, I, you know, I, I made some, we're making some changes there, and I'll talk about that in here in a second. Competition is not so much knowing, you know, what kind of weapon systems they have. It's really about how they think. How do our adversaries think? And if we understand how they think, a little bit about their culture, it helps us to, you know, to better compete. Because we can, we can burn a lot of JP-8, but if we burn it in the wrong place for the wrong reason, it's not going to actually help us compete. Okay? And the last one is design implementation. It's really how we look at the future of the Air Force and think about where we need to be 5, 10, 15 years from now and how we start to make the transition there. Uh, just this past week, or last week, um, I uh, laid out modification one to the action orders. And the action orders are written in a five-paragraph format for a very distinct reason, because that's the way it happens in the joint world. If we're going to operate in the joint world, we've got to understand how people write in the joint world. At the same time, um, having served uh, most of my uh, career, as a, uh, my time as a general officer in joint assignments, uh, you do modifications to the orders because things change. The facts and assumptions where you started with the orders actually change. Sometimes the orders, you know, when they meet contact with the staff, they don't survive the way you thought. And so we did modifications to each one of them. Airmen didn't change. Uh, action order A didn't really change much because we're on a good path there. Um, action order D, uh, design implementation, didn't change much because we're on a good path there. We're just aligning a bit more with the, our, new, our new Secretary of the Air Force. Action order C probably had some deeper changes because we had more time to really think about how we approached that. And one that's probably changed the most is action order B in bureaucracy. And what we did there is actually moved it out of the A57 as the uh, here on the, on the, on the staff uh, as the OPR and moved it up to the vice chief of staff so we can drive a little harder on things you want to do. It's really about collaboration and doing Microsoft Teams, all the things we've been kind of doing during COVID, but taking it to the next level. And so uh, we're, we, are, we are making some progress, but probably not the, at the rate I want in, in certain areas. Um, but change is hard and change takes time. And uh, uh, I think part of this, if we really believe in it, we need to be persistent and consistent to continue to move forward. And that's expect, exactly what I expect. Now, when I look at the action orders, they're primarily written here for the Air Staff, but it's really intent, you know, my intent for the Air Force of how we approach things. And so with that, it's basically a license for you to go out as, as uh, senior leaders, as new chiefs, to take a look at those and how do you apply those at your location. And so I just ask you to think about that for each one of those, how those apply to things you can do and where you can have an influence. And probably the most important place you have an influence is with our Army. And so if I get to the next slide, please. Here's what I expect of you as, as new chiefs. And this is what I expect of our old chiefs that I can see sitting in the front row uh, as well. Um, I expect you to be, uh, uh, be experts that can really uh, drive not only your expertise or your career field, but experts about the Air Force because you're, you're, you bring yourself to a different level. Um, I think you need to be candid and comfortable to uh, the challenge the status quo. And, uh, and I realize you know, the reason why you're here is because you've been, you know, been able to challenge the status quo in the past. I also think it's not so much about driving consensus, it's actually getting to the right answer. Okay, and it's how do you bring people along as you do that. It's how you provide options that are uh, really for the enterprise, um, not just for your, you know, your part of the Air Force, but really more thinking more broadly about the entire Air Force. And it's also taking care of the airmen and families that you're privileged to lead and really supporting your, your leadership team uh, as, you, uh, as you do that. And so if I, if I go back and you take a look at the... Uh, uh, the Little Brown Book, and what it talks about uh, and what we expect from chiefs. And from Chief Master Sergeant, they're charged with mentoring and developing our junior enlisted personnel. At the same time, they have a strong influence on our company grade officers and their professional development. So that one day, they're going to be sitting in a chair just like this as a senior officer. They can always go back and look to a senior NCO 
to help influence them and get them on the right path when they start their career. You need to bring your expert, your experience, your both your, your technical expertise, but your leadership expertise to the uh, to the table. And then it's really how you uh, develop and run organization, bring your organizational skills, and work your assigned tasks. It's really about uh, as well as it you know, kind of changing out of the uh, the little brown book is how you balance the aspect of airmen and mission. We've got to get the mission done, but if we're not taking care of our airmen. Uh, we can't get it done. I like to say that all the equipment we have would be a static display without our airmen. And so we really need not just you, but it's how do you motivate those airmen to, uh, and empower them. And that's why when we look at uh, Air Force uh, Doctrine Publication 1 and the aspect of mission command, what that really is is trust and empowerment. One, that our airmen trust their leadership, that we have their back. At the same time, um, we trust our airmen. We're able to empower them. We're able to allow them to do some things. And, and so when we do that as, as leaders, uh, I really think there's there's three things I think about. You got to be able to do, uh, delegate, tolerate, and iterate. You got to delegate more, okay? Which means you, you can't do it all, particularly as you move into the role as a chief. You're going to have to delegate to some other senior NCOs, some junior NCOs uh, to make things happen. You got to tolerate, which means they're not going to do it exactly like you would. And so you can't get upset because they're not going to do it exactly. This is a chance for you to mentor by tolerating a little bit more. And you got to iterate more, which means you got to be involved in the process. You can't wait till you get a finished product and then go, hey, I don't like that, and, and then start over again. you got to be involved. So I, I really look at myself as an action officer here in the Pentagon. I've served as an action officer before. I'm just a more senior action officer. Probably has a little more throw weight now. But I like being involved in the process. I do not like getting things at the end and going, and now people want me to go, you know, sign off on it. And I, I don't really have, you know, I don't have buy-in to it. And so this is how, as a leader, I think you got to be, you know, in, in, the, in the trenches with your women to help them move uh, some of these things along and get their ideas as you, as you move forward. I think you also need to be a trusted advisor. Because of your years of experience, what you're going to have is that you're going to be a conduit of information. Because I will just tell you as a chief, folks don't come talk to me to tell me all the bad news. That's why I tend in on the SIM staff sometimes. Because some folks will come talk to her. And then we talk just about every weekend and catch up on, okay, here's some things that she heard that I, you know, folks aren't telling me. Um, or I can also tell her some things I'm hearing that, that maybe don't filter down to the field. Here's, here, here's the why. And how we bring those two of those things together is so important. And, and you got to build that relationship with the uh, uh, different aspects of the leadership team. I think it's also as an advisor on how we do enlisted PME, how we do uh, the loan environment, how we look at uh, our, our STEP program and identify those exceptional performers. How we work uh, uh, the mentoring of our airmen to get to uh, CCAF and get to Airman Leadership School, NCO Academies. And the last part is really speaking truth. And because you're going to see some things, it's really how you do it, you know, and you can, you can sit back in the back and complain, or you can actually bring, uh, you know, not only a problem, but some solutions. Because the one thing I, I you know, what I, I talk about is a, is a chief. You know, you can come to give me the problem, I can probably solve it, but if you don't bring a solution, I'm probably going to solve it not the way you want it. You're going to go, I wish he hadn't done that. And so the more you're able to kind of provide some solutions and some recommendations, I think that'll be important. I talked about the mentorship already, and, and I won't hit on that again, but it's important that you, you mentor, and you're always going to be a mentor as a chief. People are going to turn to you. And uh, you really got to think about if, uh, if you're, the, you're, you're the old crusty chief and no one wants to talk to you, you ain't doing mentoring. Okay? You got to be approachable. You got to be people who got to be willing to come up to you and see you as a person uh, that they want to engage with. In order to do that, you got to be visible. And so you got to get from behind your desk and get out and, uh, and spend time with folks so that your airmen can, can see you. And that includes not just on the airmen, but I would also say in the local community as well. Because you have a, you, you, you have a lot of influence on how we shape things in our, in our various local communities. Uh, next slide. So I'll be shifting gears and what, what do our airmen expect from you? And, and, and I can say this with, uh, with some credibility because of... Um, Every base I go to when I visit the base, I always go and have breakfast with airmen. Uh, 10 to 12 airmen that are uh, that sit down with me, and uh, I do it without the leadership in the room. So if I show up at your base and you go, hey, hey uh, 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 CSAF, is it okay if I sit in the breakfast with the, with the young airmen? The answer is no. So don't, don't bother asking. Okay, I do the same thing with the wing commanders. I, I was at the wing commanders course last week. I said, if I show up at your base and I'm having breakfast with your airmen, don't bother asking because I'm not going to invite you to the room. 
I want to just sit down with them. This is how I get feedback. Because, uh, you know, ideally, I, I try to tell stories of my experience to open them up. And one of the things I always ask them, one question I always ask is, what do you want from your leadership? And the things that they always tell me is, I want my leadership to know me as a person. I want them to, to, uh, to care about me. And I want them to support me. And so part of that is, you know, us, you know, in some cases, I would say, in, you know, be able to, to virtually take off your own rank and be able just to sit down with people and get to know them. And, and that's, that's what they're going to want to know. I mean, they just want someone to, to, to get to know them. And then sometimes they want to get to know you. You know, how did you get to become a chief master sergeant in our Air Force? And everybody, you know, none of us are overnight sens sensations. You know, th this is, you know, a couple of decades, if not more, worth of work to get where you are. And you probably got some stories. I bet every, there's about a handful of you in the room that probably lost a stripe or two. And, uh, you know, it was a, a moment. I, you know, there's some things happening where I failed. That, uh, you know, my initial check ride in the F-16, I failed. So, how, I mean, how, how are you doing your first operational squad and you fail your check ride? What kind of mark does that leave? You did, I mean, it's, but it's a, it's a motivator. It's those kinds of things that, that I want to know about us to go, hey, you could, you could have some setbacks and still be successful. And so I think it's important that we do think about that and how we empower and we look at our women and how we help them solve problems. And often, you know, what they get frustrated with, and this is another part they get frustrated with, is there's someone in the middle, there's an NCO uh, above them that doesn't really, you know, it's, not, it's just not uh, working with them or always tells them no. And uh, this is where, um, you know, we as leaders can really engage with our women to get a better sense of where things are to help drive. And sometimes they got to push from the bottom, and we got to pull from the top to pull these things together. And that's why it's so important that we are engaging with them and listening to what they uh, what they have to say. And so part of it is also building strong relationships um, with our uh, with your first sergeants, with the key spouses, and with the junior leaders, the first line supervisors that will give you that feedback. And then you'll you'll probably have some of your your trusted agents that will talk to you and come tell you things that others won't. That won't give you the half truth that is really a cowardly lie. And, and so you, you really got to spend some time engaging to get information. You got to fight for that information. It's just not going to roll up to you on a, on a super platter. And so let me uh, shift gears real quick, and I'll give you some of my, my thoughts on leadership. Next slide. I use this uh, this presentation and this at pretty much uh, at all levels, uh, from our most junior levels to our most senior levels with our, uh, with our general officers. And so what I really believe about leadership is uh, in order that before you can lead others, you got to lead yourself. The first thing I do is uh, think about the, with the, the graphic there, Daisy and Daffy Duck, is to dance with what brung you. You are a chief select because of who you are, what you have already done. It's how you've already danced throughout your career. Okay? So don't all of a sudden now, because now you're your chief, start changing everything because you're going to step on your own toes. And people will just see right through it. Be yourself. Now, but you also can pick up other dance steps as you go. You always need to continue to learn as a leader. So don't uh, don't go change a lot. Continue to learn and put some other dance steps in your repertoire as a leader. Next graphic on a uh, scale of 1 to 10. If you're 2, you're never going to be a 10. Fact. 50% of the world is below average. 50% of the people that are on this net right now are below average. The question is, below average at what? And so what you need to do is do a little bit, a little bit of self-assessment. And there are certain things you're probably a two at and certain things you may be a six or seven at. The things you're a two at, you can work really hard and get yourself to a three, four, or five and be average. The things you're a six or seven at, you can work really hard at and get yourself to eight, nine, or ten. What I encourage you to do, the things you're a two at, is just give up. Hire somebody with that skill set and make them part of your team. Or bring them into your team and let them... You know, let them carry that load. And you work on the things that you're kind of good at to get yourself to 8, 9, and 10. Okay? It's a, you know, it's a whole aspect for those that have seen for other, you know, opposite attract. I'm, I'm an introvert. My wife is an extrovert. Okay? I'm a two as an extrovert. So I married an extrovert. It's that kind of concept that you got to be thinking about. That's why I have the vendors on the slide. I'm a, I'm a huge Spider-Man fan. And uh, when I think about the vendors, and you think about, you know, what you're good at, what your super, you know, what your superpower is. If the Avengers all had the same superpower, would they be the Avengers? If your team all acted and operated exactly like you, 
Would you be a high powered functioning team? Probably not. So take the time to figure out your own skill sets, the things your 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 superpowers, figure out the things that are not your superpowers, and surround yourself with people that have the superpowers you do not have. Uh, next is um, more economists, less Sports Illustrated. So until recently, I you know I, I was reading Sports Illustrated all the way through college, since I was in college, and uh, so I've, uh, I'm a huge NFL fan, and so I really like, like following sports. But I also realize you know, as you get more senior, you can't just talk about the things you're interested in. And so when I, you know, when I go to Mongolia to meet with the Mongolian air chief, I can't talk NFL football because he, he has no clue what I'm talking about. I got to be talking and thinking about more world events. And so uh, when I was a one star and went to Capstone, uh, General Ashley was our senior mentor, and uh, he was really plugged in. And you know, and everything was going. On, I go, you know, I, I go. I mean, how's this retired four star keeping track of stuff? Hell, I don't even know about. And so. Um, I stopped him in the bar one night and said, sir, how do you do this? He goes, well, I read The Economist. So I have a description to this economist, and I've been reading it since I was a one-star. I'm not advertising for The Economist. All I'm telling you is broaden your perspective. The one thing I like about The Economist, it's, uh, it's not a U.S. publication. So it provides a different perspective. It goes once around the world uh, every week. And so it basically keeps me clued in on some things I probably wouldn't read otherwise in Sports Illustrated or something else that I, I, I enjoy doing. And so all I'm telling you is to broaden your perspective, get outside your comfort zone. It's going to help you be a better leader. Now on the bottom row there, um, as you get in position and you're getting in, uh, to, to your position to lead, you got to have vision. And the higher you go, the further out that vision needs to be. You're going to want to follow you. They just want to know where the hell you're going. And you need to know where the hell you're going. And so and you also be able to articulate it. And you need to kind of think about whatever your vision is. You need to be able to... Uh, Make it short and sweet that you can remember it and they can remember it. And then you got to repeat it over and over and over again. Because there's always going to be someone new to the organization who hasn't heard it before or somebody who's been in the organization just hadn't been paying attention. And so it's important that you, you make sure you're communicating that vision. You know what matters. Your credibility, your words, and your relationships. Your credibility is really important. And so as a chief, realize you not, not only represent yourself, you represent every other chief master sergeant in the Air Force. And so the impression you make as, as you go forward um, is important. And the aspect of that is that you're going to have, we all will have some off sucks moments, myself included, even at this level. It's how you handle those to maintain your credibility. The aspect that you, you, know, you want to have enough credibility in the banks, when you have that off sucks moment, people kind of go, God, that was strange. That's not, that's not characteristic of this particular chief. But that's not, you know, not characteristic of this leader versus that is par for the course. And so think about your credibility and, and the things you do and the fact that now you're at a, you know, a bigger fishbowl where folks are watching you. Your words matter. And so as a, as a, as a chief now, uh, people are going to hang on your every word more so than they have in the past. And so uh, as we, uh, here in Washington, D.C., we talk about the Washington Post desk. If, if you're okay with what you said or what you put in an email, on the front page of the Washington Post, then knock yourself out. If it makes you uncomfortable, you probably don't want to say it or put it in an email. And so just think about that, that, that you know, choose your words wisely. And uh, realize that uh, particularly when you tell people, hey, do not repeat this or don't forward it, I can guarantee you that it's been, you know, forwarded at least five times or repeated at least five times. You know, General Brown told me not to tell you, but, and then they spill their guts. Okay, you might use that as a technique. Do you want something to get out? Tell people not to repeat it. Don't forward it. You know, that may be, be able to get the word out. Last thing is your relationships matter. Uh, I never want to cold call somebody in a crisis. And so what I do is I actually I keep people on a, on a rotating uh, engagement schedule where I try to call, talk, send emails uh, just so just in case. And I never burn a bridge. Okay. I may not use the bridge again or very often, but I never burn a bridge. And so one of the things I do, I have a number of Arab chiefs from around the world on WhatsApp. And I correspond with them just, just because. And it's actually pretty interesting because uh, it, it drives the staff crazy sometimes because they want, they want to deviate from WhatsApp of what we're talking about. I go, we're just talking. Because you never know. I might, I might need something. Or they might need something. But it's just a good way to build relationships that because uh, you never know when you're going to need it. Uh, last thing is your, uh, your leadership is like your theme song. And so now as a brand new chief, and you're all, you know, as you get ready to move to your next location, folks are going to ask, hey, what is chief fill-in-the-blank like? What they're really asking, what is your theme song? 
And so as your theme song, you know, um, just like in an NFL stadium, for those that have been, you know, NFL or any other stadium where they, you know, their music's rocking, everybody's getting pumped up, everybody's excited because you're going to show up. Or is it because like a uh, um, smooth jazz or coffee shop music where everybody's kind of laid back and they go, this is going to be great. You know, we're not going to get much done. Or is it going to be like a horror movie? They don't want to walk in the door and talk to you. I think you need to have all three of those on your playlist. There's times you got to get people pumped up to get to get things done. There's time that they're uh, they got a lot of thrust and no effect, and you need to slow them down. And there's times you need to fire for effect to get their attention. The thing you need to think about is the theme song that you think you're playing. You better hope that's the same thing they're hearing. Okay, and this is why you need to get feedback. And you have to trust your agents because your 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 playlist may be completely different that you're playing or you think you're playing from what you're hearing. And you won't be able to lead us effectively. And so I just ask you to think about that. And so um, I think, that, you know, the last thing I would, I would highlight to you even before I open up for, uh, for questions is just like I started out, never throw a brick and hide your hand. Uh, don't tell a half truth. Be willing to, to speak up and realize that sometimes you get, you got to choose your words wisely. You may not, you know, say exactly what you think, but you got to get the point across. And that's how it's going to be if, make you effective as a chief, whether you're talking up the uh, chain of command or you're talking down a chain of command to Army. And I think the Army want to see you as, as real people that, you know, one day they want to be you. And this is why I think the aspect of being able to have fun in these uh, positions is you want someone to come in and replace you that actually, and, and really, there's going to be some, you know, as I said, every day is a, a good day, just some days are better than others. You need to highlight and what you learn from those days that aren't as good as the other days. Um, and, and how you mentor our image so they can be uh, better postured as they go into the future. So to get to the uh, last slide, which I guess is back to the logo there, and then let me open it up for, uh, uh, for your questions. Hey, Chief. Uh, Chief Tony Slap from SOC here. Uh, great points all. Thank you so much for spending the time with us. What gaps have you seen come to light with recent events, uh, specifically for the competition action order that you think is going to change in the future? Thank you. Yeah, the, I think the, the gaps that I see, um, one is our understanding of the adversary. And I'll just go back to, you know, when I came in the Air Force, I got commissioned in 1984, so I came in during the Cold War. And so we actually really had a really good uh, understanding of Soviet doctrine, Soviet equipment. Um, you could go to the bathroom without some kind of, at least in a fighter squadron, where, what I grew up in, without some kind of uh, uh, something you, to look at to remind you of the threat. If you think it's a PRC is our pacing challenge, how, if I were, you know, if I walk around and ask women about the PRC and about their capabilities, uh, about their doctrine, how well do we understand it? I would say, I, even for myself, I don't think I fully understand it. And so the actual order sees just as much for me as it is for everybody else. You know, because we can actually do a lot of things with our, our military might. But if we don't understand what button it push, if it's a button we do want to push, how our adversaries respond to it, then we're not necessarily competing. You know, when I was a PACAF commander, we were doing the, our, our bomber missions. The question I asked our staff was, do they know what we're doing? Do they care? And how do I know they care? And I don't want to make them better. But I want to better understand how they, you know, when we do things, how they, how, might, how they might act and respond. And so from across the board, one of the things that the SIMSAF and I are focused on is, you know, how, to the lowest level we can to provide our airmen intel briefs. Or to spend more time talking about the culture of the countries that, you know, being more worldly in certain areas. And it's so easy to get so much more information than, you know, you know there was no internet when I was a captain. You know, my first email address was when I was a captain. And, and so the access to information is much better than it is today. So that's one part. I think the other gap I think about that I, 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 uh, I worry about is um, as we are all looking and coming out of what we've been doing you know, as an Air Force for the past 30 years, particularly in the Middle East, um, the capabilities we require for the future. And that's why I see, and this is why Accelerate, Change, or Lose is so important to me, is the, the capabilities we have today are not the capabilities we're going to need for the future to make our army successful, to make our nation successful. Not that we want to go to conflict, but to be able to deter as well. And, and so making that transition is where we need to be to be able to close that gap. At the same time, as we look across the joint force and start thinking about what we might have to do in a high-end fight, 
uh, that's another aspect of, uh, of error. Matter of fact, we were in a brief yesterday where I thought we were very focused on one capability at the expense of some other things we need to be thinking about. And part of that, part of my role now is a, not just the service chief, as the chief staff of the Air Force, but also as a joint chief, is how we raise, you know, those topics to go. These are the gaps that we need to be focused on and capability for the joint force to be able to uh, to be able to employ better. All right, thanks for the question. This is a pretty shy group. You guys are you guys are bringing it pretty weak this morning. Senior Thomas from uh, Nellis Air Force Base. Yep. You talk about uh, ten being the best, two being something we should give up on. When it comes to the uh, to the Air Force, what is it that we do that's a two, and what should we be? "Quote unquote," giving up on, and uh, who should we be looking uh, looking to to solve that solution? Yeah, as a two, I think one of the areas that I would highlight for ourselves is uh, we don't stand up for ourselves enough as an Air Force to be able to talk about our capabilities and what we do and what we need to be able to do. Uh, I, I think the other services are uh, fairly parochial in some cases about how they approach things. Uh, particularly here in Washington, D.C., and we, uh, as an Air Force, I think play a little bit too nice. Now, I can't hire somebody to do that, and that's not what I'm going to give up on, but it's really how we change our approach. And uh, I'll just tell you, what, if you go back and read Accelerated Change Rules, one of the things I talked about was collaboration, and it was collaboration in terms of the Air Force, collaboration with industry, and collaboration uh, on the Hill uh, with Congress. And so I've, uh, I, I've been really focused on that and you probably you know one of the things we put together was some narratives on some key things we want to achieve for the air force and be able to do, be very uh, uh consistent and persistent in our message moving forward and it's something we need to change now it's you know like i said went not hire anybody but i think i can learn from what the other services are being able to do to actually how do we make uh uh a, a better display of where the you know and be able to talk better about what the air force needs to go forward and so that's an area that uh, i think we need to improve upon i will tell you that as we uh as the uh, National Defense Authorization Act that was signed uh, by the president back in December, uh, we were able now to start to retire some things that we've been having difficulty retiring. Uh, at the same time, what I've, I've been thinking about, as a matter of fact, I wrote this down this morning. We have so many people that are so interested in what the United States Air Force does and telling us how to do things. We need to step up and kind of highlight some of those things, uh, be a bit more bold about it, because I really felt like, uh, you know, sometimes we show up each day, they take our lunch money, and we come back the next day with more lunch money. They get taken to the bank, which impacts our readiness. And, and so that's an area that uh, we, we as an Air Force have to be, uh, we got to pat our chest a little bit more about what we do for the nation that nobody else can do. Go back to what we did the last two weeks of August. No, no other nation, no other Air Force in the world could do what we did. Probably not the best of, uh, or ideal circumstances, but there's no other Air Force in the world that could do what we just did. And that, that's the thing about Air Force. We're very popular for uh, what we're able to do, but we got to be able to talk more boldly about what it is we do. And so that, that to me, is an area of improvement that we have to work on, and that we got to be consistent with our message. And uh, I think sometimes the feedback I get here, particularly in D.C., is we kind of we keep changing our mind. And uh, what someone told me here is the uh, absence of a yes is not a no. And so sometimes we take the absence of a yes as a no, and so we start changing our story versus going no. Keep, keep, keep pressing. And uh, that's the thing that I think we, we, we've got to continue to work on to be able to better articulate what we want to do as an Air Force. Um, and so that, if I had to grade ourselves as an Air Force overall, that's where I'd give ourselves a two. Uh, where I give ourselves a six or seven is the aspect that we are actually, um, we got outstanding people that make things happen. No matter, you know, the lack of resources we give them, the lack of training in some areas, um, but it's not due to lack of trying. Part of that is to, and that, that's one thing I learned about coming up here at the building is uh, it's all about money, which means you, you got to fight harder for it. You got to make the case for it. And uh, that's, that's the area I'm focused on. Thanks. Sergeant Chief Hayden from uh, USAFE, since the, everyone in the room is bringing a week, uh, I'll give you one. So on the congressional engagements, so through the years, you know, I've been a chief for a couple minutes. Uh, I've, 
changed my perspective on staff Dells and Codells. And I know some of these people in the room are going to have plenty of staff Dells and Codells come to their bases. So some advice and uh, just some mentorship maybe on how we should operate in that environment. Thanks, sir. No, that, that's actually an excellent question. Um, the, uh, I will tell you the staff Dells sometimes are more important than the Codells. Because the members got a thousand things they're worried about. The staff deal, the folks from the staff are the ones that are probably focused on defense. And they're the ones that actually write the bills that go into legislation that either give us the authorization to do things or give us the appropriation to go execute. And so it's very important that uh, there's a couple things that I would really highlight to you. One is to understand where the Air Force is at big picture wise. And what I've been trying to do is, is really transmit um, with the action orders, with the accelerate change or lose, and uh, uh, the narratives we've written that the MATCHCOM commanders have, and, and uh, they're unclassified, and we actually, those are out, and we'll make sure that, the, the, I'll make sure that you have access to them. But it really talks about these big things where the Air Force is trying to head, and to really understand those, you know, where the Air Force is heading. Because what we've talked about is, um, you know, we don't have many voices, but one bullhorn. If we keep all saying the same thing, by and large, what we need for the Air Force, that helps us you have some level of consistency as we engage with these uh, with these staff deals. The challenge we have sometimes is where we have uh, you know some one offs, where uh, whether it's a, either a base or a matchcom has something they want to do, and I already know we're not going to fund it. And so one of the things that uh, I've been focused on is um, making sure we're we're on the same message. So so that's one part. The other part is allow them to meet your airmen. It's great for them to talk to you, but it's better when they talk to your airmen. And they can tell them stories about what it is they need in order to be able to execute what we're trying to get done. And uh, uh, they, particularly if, they, if it's an airman from their state or district, because they'll, make it, they'll build a relationship. It goes into a little bit of the relationships matter. Um, and uh, you just don't, uh, you know, when you get a co deal or staff deal, you do want to put some effort into it because they're the ones writing the checks. And if we don't, you know, invest that time with them, um, you know, we just don't get as much money, as many resources. So it's, it's really important that you, that you spend time with them uh, as, as you lay things out and, uh, and really understand the big picture of Air Force message where we're trying to head as well. I realize that's maybe a little different down at the base level, uh, but, the, you know, the, between the match comms and the uh, number of Air Forces, they have those levels of detail. Uh, and so I'd, I'd ask you just to make sure you're, as you're at prairie for a uh, staff or cold deal that's coming to your base, that you reach out to your higher headquarters and go, hey, what are some key messages that we can uh, we can provide? And that's the thing I'm trying to really do is, is push that information down so you have it and be able to use it when they, when they come to your base. Um, and realize that they're, they're a captive audience when they're at your base. And, the, and it's a good way to actually show off the Air Force and show off your airmen as well. Good, good question. Thanks. Good morning, Chief. Good morning. This is Senior Master Sergeant Jackson from the Pentagon. My question is, is taking care of airmen. With the prevalence of COVID, um, with mental health is the hot topic issue we've all seen uh, within our lives and our careers. Um, with technology, is there a way that we can leverage the apps that are already out there to help our airmen get the help that they need? Because the airmen within the NCR, they're struggling getting mental health appointments. I'm struggling getting mental health appointments for my children. How can we leverage technology to help everyone? Yeah, thanks Thanks for the question. It, you know, one of the areas that uh, um, if you go back to pre-COVID, um, to be able to tell, you know, using telemedicine for mental health was something that you know, really by law in a number of di different locations you could not do. Uh, and so there is the ability to do uh, using technology to allow for, for mental health appointments. I think the challenge we have now is there's just not enough mental health providers to satisfy the, uh, the need. And that, 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 lies, that is a challenge, whether you're inside of uh, the Department of Defense, military, but even outside of the military. Um, so I don't, have a, you know, I don't have a good answer on how we actually you know, provide appointments faster other than the aspect of um, you know, being able to use technology to actually, it actually does provide the, the uh, providers more opportunities to, to see more, uh, more patients. 
Um, so, so that's one aspect. I think the other thing that I, I also want to focus on, this is one thing that I think that we can all work on. Um, there, there's the aspect of what we do as leaders to help our airmen before they have a mental health crisis. And it goes back to what I said earlier about, you know, annoying your airmen, spending time with them so they feel confident they can come down. And sometimes, you know, um, you know, some folks just want somebody they can talk to and confide in. And sometimes folks need, actually do need a mental health provider. And so what can we do to, as, as leaders to, one, provide uh, uh, a recourse for our airmen to come talk to us? How do we look at the tools that we provide to, uh, our airmen when they go to Airman Leadership School, Squadron Officer School, NCO Academy? Not to make them mental health providers, but to make them more empathetic. And you look at the Airman Leadership qualities, and one of those is emotional intelligence. So you're able to better to connect with airmen to help them uh, through this process. One of the areas that... Uh, uh, SIMSAF just, it's in working, is a uh, very access working group um, on the kind of fortifying the force initiative. What we're really trying to do is actually be able to, very similar to what we've done on diversity and inclusion with our very access working groups, is be able to talk to airmen about their challenges, one, to get access to mental health, the process that we make them go through to get there, and the feedback, just like you described, the, uh, you know, how long it takes to get a mental health appointment, or other tools to, of, of resiliency where we actually run into, you know, we give you the runaround. You, we may have a number of good programs, but as an airman in the field at the base, um, the, the ability to actually work through those programs and, and get the support you need, uh, I think sometimes is lacking. And, you know, that's a part that we, particularly here in the Pentagon, have a, need to have a better understanding of the aspect of, yeah, we may have a good program, looks good on paper, but in execution, it doesn't, it doesn't it's not meeting, it, meeting the need of our airmen. Um, so, you know, I, I wish I had like a answer whether I, I could say, hey, there's mental, mental health providers, you know, at the ready and can get you an appointment, you know, uh, as quickly as possible. But uh, I'm, I'm going to be realistic with you. It's a challenge for all of us. And uh, this is something that we're, we're going to continue to work on. I'm not giving up on it just because it's a challenge. Um, I, I think it's something we got to continue to work on. And this is something we got to work on together uh, as well. So I appreciate the, your, your feedback, but uh, it's something we, we're going to have to continue to work on. Thanks. Morning, Chief. It's Chief James from Langley. Um, just a question in regards to the feedback you're getting at your level from the airmen uh, whenever you're sitting having lunch with them. As far as making a connection uh, from our real-world real threats like China and Russia, are they making that connection? Do they realize uh, that those threats exist and the gravity of those threats? Thanks. I, I, I would say, uh, thanks, Chief. Uh, I, I would say yes and no. Um, you know, in some air, some airmen, um, maybe not as much, but there's others. Based, you know, based on the questions and some, it's interesting because sometimes I get some really deep questions from these young airmen. You know, they're they're uh, you know, senior airmen A one Cs, and and, the, it, and so it even the questions they ask me will challenge me, and to me that's a good sign. But there's others where the, the questions just aren't, aren't aren't there. So there's a balance there, and I don't expect that. You know, um, and it's really. A, I would say even in a room there today, there's probably different levels of understanding of this particular pacing challenge. And, uh, you know, what I really look at, how do we continue to challenge ourselves? And so when you, you know, when someone brings up something and they start talking about it, you don't know about it. That's what I feel. Someone starts talking about something I don't know about it. I go, I, got, I think I need to learn a little bit more about that. My challenge is I don't have enough bandwidth to actually spend as much time reading some of this stuff and be able to stay awake at night to, to read it as well. But the aspect there is there are airmen that actually – uh, get it, but I also think that the more and more we start talking about this as leaders, the more and more our airmen, you know, start to pick up on it. And uh, this, it's a challenge to us too because we got to stay uh, a little bit ahead of the game as well. So when we're talking and get questions about it, how we approach it. So I, I would say uh, yes or no, uh, but I think it's getting better. And I will just tell you, you know, just based on my experience from uh, at PACAF and now a year and a half as a chief, I've watched how things have evolved. Um, with deeper understanding of our uh, of our pacing challenge, uh, I would say you know what we're seeing right now uh, in in Europe is another one that's actually uh, teaching us some things, um, and it's important that we we as airmen pick up on these things. And uh, one of the things I would also highlight, I, I mean, I talked about intel briefs. I, I will tell you, I spend probably about half or more of my time reading unclassified information as much as I read classified information uh, on different things, just to get. Uh, uh, perspective 
that may not get into the intel. Um, and I think that's an important aspect for all, all of us as well. So um, it's something that we got to continue working on, which is why I have Action Order C, to drive ourselves to really think about that. I know you're going to get a brief uh, um, here uh, from uh, Ms. Krista Achenbach, who runs our, uh, our team on competition, on strategic assessment, and, uh, and kind of where we are, and some things that they are working on as well to help us with Action Order C. Thank, thanks for the question, Chief. Good morning, sir. This is uh, Senior Davis from USAFEF Africa. With Accelerate Change or Lose, the main headline is the Air Force that we have today isn't necessarily the Air Force we may, t we may need tomorrow. But what are some of the challenges that you're prioritizing uh, for the challenges that we face right now today? Well, it's really how we, how we balance risk. And so one of the challenges I have right now is the, uh, the aspect of being able to articulate how much Air Force we have available, how much capacity we have and how we need to make sure that we maintain a level of readiness of that capacity as we transition to the future Air Force. And as you transition to that future Air Force, you're also going to have some areas, you know, as you make a, you know, for any of us that have been in a unit where you convert it from one uh, platform to another or did a mission change, uh, you're not C1, you know, combat ready. You're going to take a dip down. You're going to have to come back up. And so it's how we articulate that aspect. And that, that's the challenge I have is when I'm working with, um, with the various combat commands and the demand signals they have uh, on the capacities we do have, and, and and then at the same time be able to make that transition to the future. The other part I'm really focused on as well is, you know, what is our current state of readiness and how did we get here? In some cases, we are not doing so well. And part of my job here is to go articulate that to say, hey, if you want the Air Force to be ready to go do things, we cannot burn it all up doing a bunch of other things that may not. Uh, it may, may not be as important. Maybe important in some cases, but we got to actually kind of balance that risk between what we're doing to support readiness for the service, future modernization, and the risk of what the combatant commands are working on as well. And uh, that's, as a matter of fact, I had a meeting on Friday um, to do exactly that, to have that kind of conversation. You cannot continue to use the Air Force at the same rate and then be able to make the transition and have an Air Force that's going to be able to execute, whether it's in the near term, the midterm, or the long term. And, and so... Uh, this goes back to one of the early questions. We have got to be a little more vocal about you know, where we are as an Air Force and how we maintain that level of readiness and capacity as we go forward, which is why we're going to the Air Force, you know, F4, uh, Air Force Force Gen model with the four bands. So we can actually better articulate the impact to readiness if you continue to move capability forward. And you use it, you keep filling the hole. You keep filling that hole, you're not going to have anything down in the future. And that's exactly where we are in certain, uh, for certain platforms. AWACS is a good example. And so that's the area that, uh, that, that is one of my, I would say probably one of my biggest challenges is to be able to articulate that and then have folks understand it. Because the Air Force is very popular. We've got great capability. We can get there very quickly. Um, but we can't just keep using it uh, and not really uh, pay attention to readiness and future modernization. Thanks for the question. Hey, Chief, it's Senior Solis from Hickam. Question on, uh, as, you, as you talk readiness, uh, moving out, et cetera. What are your thoughts on joint basing as we move forward, as well as TF5 when we talk readiness, moving out, et cetera, with near peer adversaries? Over. Yeah. Let, let me let me hit TF5 first, and I'll come back on joint basing because I, I do have some opinions on, on on joint basing based on my PACAF experience. Um, on TF5, TF5 is an important part of what we do, and that, I will tell you when you look at total force of all the services, the United States Air Force does it the best. Um, you know, when I was a lieutenant colonel here in the Pentagon, I ran the Total Force Initiative, OPT, that stood up uh, Hill, Langley, uh, Vermont, and some of, and several other uh, areas were really focused on a path of where we are today for TFI. And so the key part I look at with, with TFI, it's the dialogue of heck, making sure we have the right mix of capability, the right mix of uh, active component versus reserve component, and the right mix of overseas versus uh, CONUS. And so the, the balance I have to have there is about a, for every, you know, squadron I have overseas, I need to have about one and a half to two squadrons of capability stateside to support those overseas rotations and PCSs. At the same time, you know, that drives a little bit of the active guard mix that we've got to pay attention to. And so I have a good relationship. Matter of fact, I'm, I'm talking to all 54 tags uh, on Thursday to talk about where we are with the budget and, uh, and, and what we're trying to get done and how that might uh, um, impact not just the air, you know, the guard, but really the entire air force. And so that's an important aspect of this. Uh, joint basing. Um, 
Joint Basin is not everything it's cracked up to be. And uh, there was great visions that it was going to save a bunch of money, and I, I don't know that it saved a bunch of money. And you just got to think about the culture of our different services and how we operate um, and why people like coming to Air Force Base is we take care of our airmen and our families. The other services probably don't do it quite as well. And this, this is the reason when I was at PACAF, we made a, a big push to uh, do some changes at, uh, at Joint Range in uh, Marianas on Guam. And we were able to get some things back to the Air Force. Um, I've talked to General Wilsbach about the same thing vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, uh, their uh, Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam. Uh, and I think we may have an opportunity here. Uh, unfortunately, the, the rail incident was very bad. And I realized how much impact it had on all our folks there in, uh, in Hawaii. But it did show to me an opportunity that there's some things that we can do for ourselves without having to, to do it all under one service. So it's a continuing conversation. It's a thing that we're going to continue to highlight. We may not get, you know, complete divorce. We still have to kind of live together, but there's probably some things we can bring back to the Air Force exactly like we did there on, uh, on Guam. Thanks for the question. Chief Reed out of uh, Greenville, Texas. Sir, can you speak to the acquisition and uh, sustainment strategy of the future? Um, many of our legacy platforms, you know, we own the source data and we can make internal decisions with our fleets. Uh, where the newer platforms, we have to ask contractors for permission, more or less. Is there any plans in the future to kind of swing that pendulum back the other way? Actually, you know, I, I would actually tell you, I think it's somewhat flipped. The older platforms, we own less of the data. We're going down a path on some of the newer platforms to own more of the data. And so one of the things that we are doing with the uh, platforms is have a government reference architecture where we actually kind of build the architecture. We drive... Uh, aspects where we own the data. And so the two programs that are growing out really well right now is uh, the B-21 and GBSD, ground-based strategic deterrent. We have the government reference architecture and we actually are driving some of the data. Um, and those are probably the, the newest of, uh, of, of the programs. The other thing is in the next generation air balance is probably the other one, is a, a, a program we're also doing that with as well. The other thing we're trying to do as we do these is how do we separate out the uh, in some cases, different systems. And I'll just use an airplane, for example. You know, on older airplanes, the uh, software for the uh, flight controls and the mission systems are all intertwined. So anytime you take a change in the mission system, you have to go back and test the airplane. It just takes a lot more time. What we're able to do now with the uh, uh, kind of containerizing or Kubernetes is be able to separate out the flight control uh, software from the mission software. So now I can have anybody compete on the mission software side or mission component. So as they meet, you know, form, fit, and function, they can do the software that inter interact with the aircraft or, or the weapon system. And so that's the path we're on and, uh, to do exactly that so that we own the data. And if we need to make a change, we can drive and not have to go back and pay, you know, a short amount of money to, to make changes. So uh, that's all part of our digital acquisition approach with a number of different programs. And uh, we, we're having some success there. Uh, it's some of their older programs where we really have a, really have the challenges where we're not able to do that. Thanks for the question. All right, I, I can take. I'll take one more. Good morning, Chief. Thanks for taking my question, Chief Washington from Luke Air Force Base. Uh, you talked about uh, capacity and and our ability to meet uh, demands on the force. Uh, do you think that? Uh, our inability to do so or the challenges that we face uh, actually impact uh, the deterrence measures that we have. It, actually, the question is, do you think that our, our enemies are still afraid of our force? Um, I think they are. Um, but I, this is why I wrote Accelerate Change or Lose. Because they're, they're not going to be lightweight forever if we don't change. Okay, well, we're, we are an outstanding Air Force, the greatest Air Force in the world, um, probably the greatest Air Force in the history of the world. But you know what happens when you're, you're, you're number one or you're the defending Super Bowl champion? Everybody's gunning for you. Same thing for the United States Air Force. We cannot sit back and rest on our laurels and just go, hey, what was good enough today is going to go on for tomorrow, which is why we have to take a hard look at ourselves and be able to make that change. And this is the challenge we have. Not only external to the Air Force, but internal to the Air Force. Because if I, you go, we walk around there and go, hey, I'm going to kill X kill a program, there's somebody in love with that program or that capability or that career field. Some of those things we have to let go of to be able to make this shift to the future to ensure we're able to deter. 
which goes into the whole aspect of action order C and competition. You got to understand our adversaries and what makes them tick and what makes them nervous about our United States Air Force and what things they're trying to do to uh, take away the advantages that we do have or erode the advantages we do have. And the better we understand that, the better we're able to uh, deter. The thing I also think about is there's a balance between capability and capacity. We can have a very high end capability, but not have the capacity to be able to use it. So if I've got, you know, only one of or a handful of a high end capability, but I don't have a lot of them, does that deter? Or is it better that I have a lower end capability that I have a lot of that I can spread out and use? And, and so that's part of why we do a war games. This is why we do this analysis to kind of figure out hey, what is the right mix of capability to, to do this. Not only to, to fight combat and generate combat power and do air power anytime, anywhere, but it's also the aspect of, you know, how do we then ensure that it's going to keep us in the level of competition over time so we don't go to, go to war. So I, I appreciate your question. I, I didn't make you want to walk, make you walk all the way up there and tell you you have to go sit down. So I forgot to take your question. So thanks for asking. Hey, so uh, I, I appreciate the time with you. I've had with you today. You know, it's uh, I, I much rather would have done this in person. And uh, uh, like I said, unfortunately, my uh, my calendar sometimes is not my own. And uh, I would say as you become a chief, that might be uh, the case as well. Um, the last piece of advice I give you is, uh, you know, again, take care of yourself. Uh, take some quality time for you. Uh, because there's always something that can be done 24-7 uh, in your, as you move in this position of leadership. Um, but you got to be, you know, rested, ready to go. And, uh, you know, feel, uh, uh, you know, healthy as you go forward. And uh, the last thing I'd also share with you is what I started out with is never throw a brick and hide your hand. If you feel strongly about it, speak up. And it's not going to change if you don't speak up or, or, or try to uh, take some action to get things done. Thanks for the opportunity to spend time with you today and look forward to seeing you around our Air Force. Take care.